Welcome to our third session in our series, Beyond Human, The Last Call. Well, if you, <clears throat> if you watched session one, you remember that we thought that it was going to be a uh, question and answer with helpers, and it ended up being just mainly listening to Doe talk, and, and we didn't get to questions. And then when we realized that session one had ended up with so many gaps or big open spaces in our big picture, and after watching session one, we decided to try in session two to specifically address the helpers that are here with me to um, pinpoint and focus in on the obvious holes or gaps in the big picture by asking questions. And the helpers we had on tape two in order to do that were June and Sawyer. And today we want to welcome Nora and Alex. They're going to serve in that capacity. And why don't we just get started? So Nora, why don't you give us the first question that we put on our list? Okay. Uh, would you like to discuss the difference between the soul and the mind and the vehicle? Okay, that's a big one. I don't know where we'll get, if we'll get past that one. <clears throat> the soul, the mind, the vehicle. Well, just even though we've discussed it a little bit before, we use the uh, reference to this body that we're wearing, this flesh and bones, uh, we use the term vehicle because it helps us separate from the body. So vehicle, now sometimes historically in religious literature, this is uh, referred to as a vessel. So whether it's a vehicle or a vessel, it helps to get it out of identifying with it and where we get into trouble is when we identify and call this me because this is certainly not me if the soul has awakened this is just a suit of clothes that i'm wearing and at times it can be an encumbrance for me it can be something that i don't want to identify with so uh, it has its own desires it's kind of like a living uh, computer that doesn't ever quite shut down uh, even when it's in a sleep state, it doesn't quite shut down. And it has uh, uh, desires that manifest in ways of wanting certain foods or wanting certain experiences or certain habits that it has been subjected to. It wants to do repeat performances in those uh, habits, whether it's food or going places or seeing things or attachments or addictions. So we'll use the term vehicle when we speak of the body that we're wearing. Now, the soul. What is the soul? That's a good one. The, the um, description that we've been given to uh, uh, picture or illustrate the soul and trying to understand its relationship to the vehicle, we can think of the soul as a pillowcase or a container, even though it's an invisible container, it's a container that is, encompasses the space that the body takes. Sometimes that we feel like it encompasses even a little outside the space that the vehicle has. So it's like a, a pillowcase or a container for the mind. So if we're talking about vehicle, soul and mind, then flesh body is just a suit of clothes, vehicle, vehicle. The real me, the identity that, that I have awakened to, that I know because I know that this, this is perishable, this can fall apart, it can die, it can return to dust, it can get uh, completely put out of commission on the freeway. Uh, <clears throat> But I am something that does not die on the freeway. I am something that goes on. I'm something that has more existence, even if you're, uh, if you, the extent of your understanding of that is to think that, well, after the vehicle dies, the soul goes to heaven. Well, we'll discuss where it goes, depending upon what you, where you think it's going to go, but 
here we're talking about identity or definition of terms. This is not me. This is my suit of clothes or this is my vehicle. I am the soul. Now, what is in the soul or what occupies the soul is mind. My mind? No, not my mind. I don't have any mind. So what am I? Well, I'm the little switch inside that pillowcase or that container that chooses what goes in it. Now, what goes in the soul? What mind stuff goes in the soul? If you go to the originator, as far as I'm concerned or you're concerned, the students are concerned and anybody that's listening to us is concerned, the originator of the mind that is available to us, there are only two sources originating of that mind. The truth, which comes from the Creator, the Kingdom of Heaven. Now, that's not truth in a philosophical sense not truth in a religious sense, it's truth in truth sense, as far as what really is. The accurate information, as far as you can understand, now, of course, accurate changes as you learn more. Uh, something becomes uh, outdated as soon as you get some new information, so, but as close as we can get to the truth, the real truth, only comes from the source of the Creator, the Kingdom of Heaven. Now, don't forget, we've talked about that member of that kingdom of heaven that was a soul, an advanced soul in the kingdom of heaven and separated from his older member or from his heavenly father, went his own way, <clears throat> and then he formed his own corporation. He had his own followers. He didn't like the definition of terms. He had a new truth. He was a counterfeit. Now, this gets in the kind of funny uh, idea that some feel and some literature seems to suggest that he is a copycat of Jesus. He's the counterfeit of Jesus. He's always trying to imitate Jesus. Well, we certainly can't go wrong by looking at it from that point of view. I don't know if that in actuality occurred, but it certainly has been occurring ever since there was a Jesus. And uh, I would imagine even before someone appeared on the scene 2,000 years ago that was identified as Jesus, I suppose that before we had that identity of Jesus that Lucy or Satan, Lucifer, did identify as a separateness, a different kind of thinking, a different definition of terms. Um, therefore, the mind other than the Creator's mind. So remember we've discussed how Satan or Lucifer and his camp, they're aggressors. They're, they're not shy. They don't wait to be asked. They fill your head with ideas all the time and you think that you're having them that these are your thoughts. The only thing that you can really identify with as you is when you question yourself is, what am I looking for? Because that's getting into the department of options or um, choices, which I know on our list of questions here is going to throw things off because I'm suddenly getting into what is free will. People talk about free will as a doctrine or a concept. Free will is something that I have, that I cannot get rid of, that it is mine forever. As long as I exist, I have free will. Now, believe it or not, Lucy sees the kingdom of heaven as interfering with your free will. The opposite of that is true. The kingdom of heaven, even though it does try to get your mind off of yourself and bring you into the mind, the understanding, the knowledge that is in the kingdom of heaven, our Heavenly Father's kingdom tries to liberate you from the misunderstanding, the wrong de definition of terms, the 
wrong concepts and bring you to the truth, tries to liberate you from things that have held you in ignorance. If there's one sin that Lucy participates in and all of his followers more than anything else, it's misinformation. It's wrong usage of terms. Uh, getting your eyes focused on, uh oh, I was about to say the wrong God. Because Lucy doesn't hesitate. He's not afraid of being blasphemous. He's not afraid to sell you a concept of God. He's not afraid of selling you a concept of Jesus that is completely off base. Okay, we'll go back and review just for a moment. Vehicle, flesh body, nothing but a suit of clothes. Even though it does have expressions of desires and lusts and things that I have to completely ignore, I don't even listen to those thoughts, one of my tasks in overcoming is overcoming the listening of any voices or any impulses that this body would give to me. So that I, uh, in the early stages of that overcoming, I might hear that impulse. I might hear it two or three times. I might even get, I might even give in to it. And then I'm sorry that I gave in to it. And so I say, well, next time I'm not going to give in to it. Then the next time I hear it, the impulse of the body, as it was asking for something that I had been told or been taught was inappropriate for me to participate in. And I was a little bit more restrictive as to what I let the body get away with second time. Okay, eventually, if I'm getting control and I'm learning my lessons, because the way the kingdom of heaven helps us in our lessons is it continues to send us the negative. Yes, it continues to send us the negative in order to give us, what do we have that's ours that we can't get rid of? Option, free will, the choice to accept the negative, listen to it, or get rid of it, control it, eliminate it. Now, there's, that's a lot of steps of growth from first hearing it express itself and giving in to it some, and then regretting it. And so when you regret it, then you go back and you say, oh, I'm sorry that I gave in to it. Can I, can I start afresh? Which same thing as saying, can I be forgiven? I, I want to conquer this thing. I don't want to just be victimized by the desires of this flesh or this body. Now, this is separate from the imposing mind of Lucy or someone in the invisible who is assigned by Lucy to get me off the path. Now, <clears throat> and there is someone assigned by Satan, his camp, to get me back on into their corporation, into their philosophy, into their way of life, because the whole set up the whole structure of this planet in this age has become the way of thinking, the activity, the definition of terms of Satan's camp. That is what it has become. Didn't have to become that. It has become that. That's a condition. Our Heavenly Father has permitted it to become that because he gives us the knowledge how to see it as that, how to work against it, how to even overcome it, how to rise above it. So in a sense, <clears throat> our Heavenly Father permits Lucy to send someone to stay close to us, to keep an eye on us, to hammer on our heads, to even use the vehicle to send us impulses that we don't want to give in to. to in other words, to constantly challenge us, the free willer, the choice maker, the one who can opt, because then, don't forget, we've got this awkwardness here. Here's this mind here and this flesh here imposing ideas on us that we didn't ask for. They just imposed them on us. And then in order to engage the help we have from the next level or our Heavenly Father's kingdom, we have to engage asking for help. We have to acknowledge to our Heavenly Father's kingdom and whatever help he has given to us, 
that we, oh, I listen to this impulse of the vehicle, or oh, I listen to that influence give me these thoughts, and oh, they aren't your thoughts, I didn't get them from you, help me not do that. And so, when you ask for help, then you get help saying, well, I thought I had gone over that with you, I'll go over it with you better, and maybe give you more ammunition in warding off the imposition of those uninvited thoughts that encourage you into activity that is not from the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's, that's it in a nutshell as far as separating the flesh or the vehicle, the soul, that invisible pillowcase or container for mind stuff, realizing that mind stuff really comes from only two sources. But if you say, for example, if this whole corporation has many, many people working in it and they work on many, 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 many projects, then there are going to be a lot of different thoughts at different levels that come in that are from our Father's kingdom, and therefore that mind stuff is from our Father's kingdom. Don't forget that comes only on the basis of our asking, our pursuing it, our desiring it. All this other mind stuff from this great big corporation that's a giant corporation, has many, many, many members working in it, is in opposition to this one over here that is the, this one is the aggressor, and this one is constantly laying on us what it considers the truth to be, which the Creator over here, the one that created truth, even the truth itself, even the understand, even the concept. All right, you see the conflict? That's what we're up against. And another thing is that we have to take into account here is the stronger I get, the better I get at my little choices by learning this, this procedure of working against the negative, asking for help and receiving it from the positive or from our Heavenly Father's kingdom, each time I go a step further and become more putty in the hands of this kingdom because I'm trying to become a part of that household and I have to get rid of individuality and the things that separate me from it, which this camp over here considers to be good things, individuality and separateness and do your own thing. Okay, each time I get a little further or a little closer to my Heavenly Father's kingdom, what happens? This corporation over here fires the guy previously that I overcame, sends a stronger one, a better one, with more tricks up his sleeve than the one previously had, and our Father's kingdom says, don't worry, don't worry. I even created those guys. I even created the options that they could take in going awry. I am the only creator. So for each right word or right definition of term, I also created a number of wrong definitions of terms that shouldn't have been used but were there as option. Wow, that gets into a big picture. How could that creator have created everything that was good? and created everything that was evil? No, did not create one iota that was evil, but did create complete potential for evil in order that we still have the capacity to maintain the one thing that he did give to us that is us, that we can't even get rid of, free will, the choice of what direction we go. Okay. Alex, what do you have on your list? Let's take our next question. I was wondering if you'd want to explain um, the difference uh, uh, in terms of life and death. Okay, that's, uh, that's right down. That's an appropriate next question. Lucy has, boy, does that really fit with what we've just been talking about. Lucy has this age this world, this society out there, as far as I know, on every hemisphere, believing that death is the death of the vehicle, the death of the body, and that life is coming in at birth through 
a birth canal, that that's life and losing this is death. That didn't come from my father's kingdom. That's, that's one of Lucy's definitions. Study your Bible if you want to learn what the proper usage of those words, and you'll very quickly learn that the way our Father's kingdom, in relating to humans in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, death was... Well, it's easier to describe death by saying that if someone expresses something that is not true and has bought into the camp of misinformation, that individual is in a dead condition by the standard of our Father's kingdom. That individual gets life once he goes out of that camp and comes into this one, or the reverse. If he's in this camp and he goes into that one, he becomes among the dead. If he comes in contact with someone from our Father's kingdom, he recognizes that this is the truth and he starts to go with it, then he has come, he has begun to taste of life. Therefore, truth and life are synonymous as far as terminology usage in our Father's kingdom is concerned. So, <clears throat> death and misinformation are synonymous. So, let's go back to the previous question we were talking about. What's in this soul or this pillowcase for mind stuff? It's never all this. It's never all from our Father's kingdom. It's never all from misinformation camp or from Satan's world. It's a composite. It's, it's percentages. Now, if I have enough of our Father's kingdom mind in there that, that I can begin to utilize it a little bit and it begins to shine through a little bit, then I'm not totally dead. And if I continue to engage it, then I begin to come more into truth, more into life, even though I've got a heavy percentage of misinformation still in there. And the more I ask for knowledge, the more I ask for lessons, the more I ask for situations that will bring the truth to me. Uh, every one of those, you don't get knowledge from the kingdom of heaven by, oh, I'm going to give you this beautiful thought, and this is knowledge. You get knowledge, you get lessons, you get information by, mainly by, hard knocks. You're thrust into a situation and a circumstance where you're tested at, uh-oh, you're tested. What am I? I'm the one who has free will. I'm the one that can take that situation and say, oh, this is horrible what has happened to me. I'm set back. My world has crumbled. Or I can say, goodness, I didn't ask for this. This happened to me in spite of my not wanting it to happen to me. So where is the positive in it? Where? And so I turn and I say to my Heavenly Father, or the closest contact I have, whatever I can use as my point of reference to the Kingdom of Heaven, knowing that I can easily even speak to the Kingdom of Heaven and be addressing the wrong crowd because they present themselves as the Kingdom of Heaven. <clears throat> but if I am asking for truth, if I am asking for anything and everything that separates me from the Most High God, from the Creator, and then I begin to get another lesson. I get another confrontation. I get another experience that jolts me that would at first initially, these guys over here are going to say, aha, see, I told you. I see what would happen to you if you stay on that path. They would have it seem to me that it was a negative. And yet if I say, I'm sure this wouldn't be happening to me if it wasn't good. I can find the good in it if I ask. That's true. It always works. That little saying, where did that saying come from? All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Might as well put true Lord in that, because then it would certainly work. So what was your question again, Alex? Well, if you could explain the, the difference in the terms of life and death. Okay, I think we should go a little further. 
with that. Life and death. I can't say strongly enough that death of the vehicle, death of the body, or losing the body, losing the vehicle, essentially has no long-term effect on me. It can put me out of a classroom circumstance for a period of time. Now, this gets into a discussion of, oh my goodness, so when I'm out of body, yes, when I'm out of body. If I'm connected with our Heavenly Father's kingdom, there are a number of choices that our Heavenly Father's kingdom can, if he reads me out on his computer and he looks on his meter and he says, that soul's worth saving, and so I just got kicked out of that vehicle in that accident on the freeway, it certainly isn't just waste. It certainly still has some goodness in it. So we're going to put it aside over here, or we're going to put it on ice, if you will, or we're going to save it in some condition now, there are times, well, let me finish that thought. In other words, our Heavenly Father's kingdom can actually take that soul, set it aside, and wait until it feels is the appropriate time to put it back into the earth condition, into the classroom condition, the, into the human kingdom, if you think of the human kingdom as a stepping stone on your way into our Heavenly Father's kingdom, if you make the right pursuits because you can also go through that kingdom and with the wrong pursuits and get out of that kingdom and be into an advanced human kingdom that's outside the age of that planet and can be seen as heaven, can be seen as a heavenly creature with heavenly skills and heaven, um, heavenly capacities. And you, you'll move into a camp that will easily take the responsibility of creating religions and all of that, and that they will, they also will give you concepts of, of um, uh, a life extending. Now, there's a big difference here. The reason these, this terminology got all messed up in the beginning of death and life. In our Father's kingdom, when you really get to be an, a full-fledged or a badge-wearing member in our Father's kingdom, not in the human kingdom, but having graduated from the human kingdom, and you are in our Father's kingdom, you take on a suit of clothes, you take on a vehicle that is imperishable and incorruptible. It cannot be destroyed. You have eternal life. Now, not only does the soul have life, but you can wear a vehicle that for all intents and purposes doesn't need to decay. It doesn't have any age. It doesn't reach a, it doesn't come from a baby. It doesn't uh, get old and need to be changed out for another one. There's no loss of consciousness. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't be hurt and discarded. In certain circumstances, it can be injured, it can be hurt, it can be lost, and you can go to wardrobe and pick up another one. And there you have a new set of clothes. No loss of consciousness, because you, all that is you, is that soul in there which still has control of free will that can make choices, that can recognize mind stuff as it comes from our Father's kingdom, and is trying more and more to eliminate the mind stuff that comes from Lucy's corporation, his misinformation camp. Okay, so the body dying or losing the body is not true death any more than a tulip plant when, as a perennial, when the plant that comes above the surface, the blossom and that plant and the freeze comes and that plant dies? No. Only what showed died. But what still was, in a sense, a genetic package of the soul, the continued existence, or the further opportunity for the soul to take a 
shell in order to learn lessons. Souls in a discarnate condition cannot learn lessons. That's the way our Heavenly Father has designed it. They cannot learn lessons. Even Lucy's camp knows there's a limitations, to, knows that there are limitations to what a soul can learn in the discarnate condition. Now, what do we mean by discarnate? We're speaking of a soul outside of a vehicle, whether it's a vehicle in the human kingdom or a vehicle in the kingdom of heaven. The discarnate can serve Lucy's camp. He can be someone that can be standing right here beside me at this moment from Lucy's camp trying to uh, interrupt my thinking, try to get me off the track, try to get me to stop asking questions as we talk to my father and to interfere with this task. And I'm sure there's one standing right here at this moment, even though I don't like to acknowledge his presence. And it interferes with me the moment I even acknowledge his presence in order to have you understand that. But in a discarnate condition, lessons cannot really be learned. You're confronted with addictions, ties, all the things of misconcepts in their application only when you're in a physical body. Now, Lucy's camp, they're pretty good at robbing bodies. They're pretty good at even using bodies and for what they want to use them for and then discard them. Even though our father's camp created them, they're his product, he has the right to destroy them if he wants to at a flash, he is much more restrained in how he would even permit any of his members to use bodies. He cares for them more, he protects them more, he doesn't just use them and then throw them away. Lucy's camp will influence you to do a task and not really get themselves that involved. Try to get you to do a task for them and they're convinced that they're doing themselves a big favor. They're also in the process of avoiding putting themselves in a lesson opportunity circumstance because they're, when they're doing that, they're out of body. Or if they're staying in their, this gets kind of awkward here, in their advanced body form, it seems strange, it's very confusing to realize that Lucy and many, many members in Lucy's camp can have what humans at this point in an age can see as unhuman vehicles. And you'd think unhuman? Unhuman. So they're heavenly vehicles, they're glorified bodies, they're, they're uh, physical bodies of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, at this point we have to go back and remember that when Satan was booted out of the household of our father's corporation, he had a heavenly body. He took, a, according to the record, he took a third of the heavens with him. Well, there must have been a bunch of people. And they had heavenly bodies. They also had a lot of technical, advanced information. They knew how to get from here to there in different means, certainly, than humans in this age would know. They knew how to appear and disappear. They knew how they had a body that had all kinds of capacity that this that human flesh on this planet in this age do not have. Don't be confused. They are not heavenly bodies. Heaven is where our Father is. They were cast out of where our Father is. The moment they were cast out, they no longer had heavenly bodies. They had what was left of a heavenly body. What do I mean by what was left? Once they were cast out of where our Father's camp is, they began to be in a condition of perishable and, uh, what's the other term? Corruptible. Corruptible. That's right. They, the most normal conditions for them, corruptible and perishable. Therefore, since their bodies become perishable, that's the only thing they're concerned with. They're not concerned with corruptible because they, they're on a different path of real knowledge. 
Uh, <clears throat> but once they became perishable, and they even know it, if you read records supposedly of people who've had encounters with uh, uh, space aliens, whether it's uh, um, Adamski's camp or, oh, we could sit and talk that kind of stuff for some time about uh, so-called encounters uh, of the third kind or the fourth kind of where they got information from certain space aliens that they would say, well, it isn't, it isn't exactly like you're told in, in your Bible. We do lose our bodies, but we can, they live a lot longer than your bodies. We can, uh, they might have several hundred years or they might have a, uh, an extension quite a bit longer than yours. Well, and therefore the person who's hearing all that thinks that he's listening to members that he's coming to the reality of what the kingdom of heaven really is. And he's shocked by it because he thinks, wow, all those religious ideas I had were, were off base. Not realizing that the camp he's talking to created those off base religious ideas and even now is selling you on, or selling that individual who's having that experience. And I am from the kingdom of heaven. We did create those religions on your planet. We are trying to help you move up the ladder so that you can serve in our kingdom and help us in our pursuit of universal mind, cosmic consciousness, becoming gods. Okay, wow. There are some identifying features of those vehicles that they wear, not all of them, but some of them. <clears throat> some of those vehicles that they wear still have gender, still have age. Uh, now, don't forget, they, Lucy and his camp retained a lot of their intelligence, a lot of their skill capacity, a lot of their technical proficiency. They know how to make spacecrafts. I'm sure uh, measured by our father's kingdom, their spacecrafts are pitiful in comparison because our father's kingdom, even at the point that Lucy and his crowd left, they, they knew a little bit more than the Model T in comparison as far as spacecrafts are concerned. But they do know spacecrafts. They do know how to travel in space. They do know how to move into parts of the heavens that certain humans on this planet, they're still trying to get out of here a little bit, go, go to the moon and then into this orbit and that one. We're just barely beginners, are the humans here. Are. And of course, they're really getting into a world that doesn't belong to them. And Lucy and his camp is circulating in a world that does not belong to them. But they can't get into our father's community. That is still held separate. But there's, their vehicles can... Uh, most of them will either, either appear to be male or female in some of its quality, even though they might be losing some of its maleness or its femaleness, frequently not of their own choice, but because when you're in outer space and you're outside the vibration of a planet that has the kind of ingredient, uh, fertilizer and uh, the ingredients that are are uh, primary to this garden, to this planet, they can lose their capacity to reproduce. Not that they would want to, but in spite of their desires. So they have to come and rob vehicles, they have to do artificial insemination, they have to do genetic experimentation. Now, as I said before, how much of this they do on this garden uh, to what extent and uh, what extent the reports that we've heard of this goes on, I do not know the particulars. It has not been given me to know them. And I feel that it's, in a sense, our protection that we don't know them. But I do know that in our Father's kingdom, in a sense, everyone is the same age. They're, I'm talking about the vehicle they wear. Because as long as they stay in that protected environment and do work in his kingdom, there is no aging. It's, it, it's as if they're all the same age. They are indestructible, imperishable, and they can't be led off the track. They can't be corrupted as long as they stay in our Father's kingdom. 
Now, if you say in this world that we would still call part of the heavens, it still has many members in it that are not of our Father's kingdom, and their vehicles then, they have to be concerned with the age of it, the protection of it, because they don't just get, they don't have that good a control, even though they're working on it very hard, to just go to wardrobe and pick up another vehicle. They're constantly, or frequently, trying to master the techniques of developing wardrobe, of developing vehicles. And they're here again, they're trying to copy our Father's kingdom so that you wouldn't know the difference. Because in our Father's kingdom, there might be a number of different types of wardrobe or suits of clothes that souls could wear. There might be little ones, and there might be middle-sized ones and big ones and have different shapes and different colored skin and uh, certain different things, and some might even uh, I'm sure that our Father's Kingdom, if our Father's Kingdom wants to use them, can certainly create what we would call robots in order to put certain things in certain areas that wouldn't want to take a chance on losing a soul, so it's just an extended device, it's a, it's a technical advancement. Lucifer has his robots. He has his counterfeit, he has his copy of the things that are in our Father's Kingdom, but they're always lousy. If they really got under the microscope by those who were in the know, they would know they couldn't cut it. They'd throw you in jail because they're counterfeit. Okay, it's because they do not have life eternal. They do not have incorruption. Now this gets me into another topic that's on our list of questions. Incorruption. Well, I'm going to go back. Narodi, let's go to yours. Your next question. Well, um, would you like to talk now about r the term resurrection and how it has changed? Okay. <clears throat> resurrection has a little different connotation than life or death. Uh, resurrection is more like a condition that you could call or you could apply to a soul when it enters a vehicle and comes in to life. Now, in order to come in, if a soul is entering a vehicle and it's coming into life, then it means that it must have advanced pretty far in getting rid of misinformation and bringing in real information, but don't forget life and truth are synonymous. So if it's bringing in real information, so it's an advanced soul. It's one that has had a lot of teaching from our Father's Kingdom and has made that choice. It, in a sense, is very close to overcoming. Now, one illustration that we might think of, or a couple of illustrations, let's take uh, the Bible. In the book of Revelation, and it talks of uh, a first resurrection and a second resurrection, at the close of the age. If a group of souls comes in and they are advanced souls, they are from our Father's kingdom, they are alive. Now being from our Father's kingdom meant that they once had to graduate into that kingdom. Now are they being protected in that kingdom because they still have a few little major touch-ups to be done so that they could stay with a, a badge that holds, so there'd be a good match to a vehicle of that kingdom, that they wouldn't still have desires that could not be fulfilled by that wardrobe or that vehicle that they would get in our Father's kingdom. Now, if a mind that is that advanced in the ways of our Father's kingdom comes and takes a flesh body in the human kingdom, then it has brought that body into life. It is suddenly living. It has resurrected. It has taken the dead, worthless plant and turned it into the epitome of life from a human's point of view, not from our Father's kingdom, but from a human's point of view. It is the most alive thing around. It possesses the most truth that can be had. Now, I'm afraid that here I need to get a little personal because 
in the same sense that as we speak to you out there, those who are listening to these sessions, I might be mistaken, but the information that has been given to me suggests that you are going to be a part of what the book of Revelation calls the second resurrection. In other words, in order for you to identify with the knowledge that is coming through us as we give it to you and recognize it as from our Father's kingdom, in order for you to recognize that means you have to have a lot of that, even though it might have been pretty well in dormant condition, a lot of that mind has to be in you or slightly outside of your vehicle craving to get in and wanting to take that vehicle. In a sense, <clears throat> if you do have some of that information, then you were once given a gift of migrating to where that information was. You received a lot of that information. You applied a lot of that information. At a given time when you lost a vehicle, the next level took your soul and put it aside carefully and protected it for the end of the age and says, now you can go back and finish up those little areas that you didn't have that much control in. Because, whoops, here gets to another touchy point, because we're sending other representatives from the kingdom of heaven who can help you with the task of finishing up your overcoming, getting Lucy out of the way, getting strong, developing muscle in not listening to him, learning the difference between the truth that can be gained through asking from the untruth or the misinformation that is fed to us without asking. The untruth always gets us back into the world, back into ties, back into addictions. Lucy's camp counts on keeping you drunk by having you addicted to the world. Addicted even in concepts, addicted in misinformation, not to say the least, addicted to the wrong kinds of things to put in your vehicle, whether it be drugs or booze or overconsuming or wrong kind of patterns. Of course, we get into an element here that's also very, very touchy ground that we've all been through, but we have to eventually face that it is the worst drug of all. And that was the drug of when we chose, and when I speak we here, I speak uh, as representatives of, of the um, offspring a family tree of Adam and Eve, that when they fell and they took on them responsibility of reproductive activity, then of course all the souls that came in to those vehicles down that chain of offspring also participated in that misinformation, saying, oh, God gave me this capacity to reproduce. Now, what I'm getting at, the worst addiction that exists is love. Uh oh, I thought God was love. Lucy uses that term. He even would have you believe that sex is love. I'm sorry. That one's a lie. Ultimately, even though we have all been hooked on that same drug, We've all gone through that period. Don't forget, we took advantage of the hothouse. We took advantage of the negative. We took advantage of the fact that we were products of those who went astray. We learned from their lessons. We overcome them. But still, sex is the strongest drug. There's not a drug, there's not a morphine or anything that is produced by chemicals or plants of this world as strong as that drug. That drug 
requires that you even let one of Lucy's technicians in that department absolutely take control of your mind and have you possessed with that fulfillment of that act. He knows that as long as you participate in that drug, your capacity for recognizing the truth is just about as good as it is for someone who's had a half a dozen martinis and you say to them, are you clear-headed? Can we really talk about significant information? They say, I'm just as clear as I ever am. <laughs> and as long as someone, I don't mean that while, just while in the act of that reproductive activity, I'm talking about as long as even those hormones are active in your system, as long as they're still cycling, you would be working against the drunkenness of that drug. Now, I know that this could sound just as far out as anything could sound, but down in your heart, if you're from my Father's kingdom, you know that Jesus was not a sexual creature. His M.O. presented itself as one of that, but Lucy would have you interpret it wrongly. You know that he was pure. Another wrong application of terms, let's take the term virginity. Lucy says that a virgin is someone that is pure, but he tacks on another addition uh, to that definition. He says, one who has never had sexual activity. Virginity, pure in the physical, yes, correct definition. But virginity meaning someone who has not had? No. Wrong application. Wrong definition. Therefore, I can recover my virginity. I can become a virgin. In a sense, someone who has never, if you really think of the soul's existence, who has never participated in that, then they don't even know what there is to overcome about it. We can, unfortunately, we can rest pretty assured that there's no one in this earth age that has been lucky enough to not participate in it, save hmm, maybe a few isolated cases. I'm not saying that our Father's Kingdom says of necessity you must stoop to participate in that and overcome it, because it might be that the truth is that when you are confronted with it, if you are confronted with it, and then confronted with it, and confronted with it, even lifetime after lifetime if necessary, and you refuse it if the same muscle hasn't been developed against that drug that would be developed had you given into it, participated in it, gotten totally addicted on it, and then had to withdraw from that addiction with the help of asking to withdraw from that addiction, getting out of that addiction. So. Unfortunately, here we had to face the issue of some real no-nos. Let's go back to resurrection. Your possible resurrection. As far as I can tell, what I have been given says that if you can see the kingdom of heaven, if you can see the truth and what is coming through this vehicle, it is not of this vehicle, it is not me, but it has been given to me and even said, now that it's been given to you, it's yours. But I can abuse it, I can twist it, I can take responsibility for it, I can think, boy, look at what good ideas I came up with. And the moment I think that way and not give credit, don't forget, information comes from two sources, comes from our Father's kingdom or for from misinformation. So, and when I receive it, if I make the mistake of taking credit for it, I am starting to separate at that point. As far as I can tell, the information that has been given to me through T, through our Father's kingdom, says, if you recognize this information, you have been in the kingdom of heaven 
Oh, wow, that's a new thought. Yes, you have been in the kingdom of heaven. If nothing more than saved on ice for this time, you've been in the kingdom of heaven. And you have now come back, and in a sense, you're standing outside of a vehicle, trying to use that vehicle. You probably picked one with the help of our Father's kingdom. You probably picked a vehicle that might be open to being acceptable to this information so that you can then try to move into that vehicle. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean you're a vehicle robber? You're a, a body snatcher? No, our Father's kingdom assigned you that vehicle. They even assigned you that vehicle to a degree at its inception. And you've been checking on it from time to time, relating to it from time to time, until this time, until you start to hear this information. And at the time that you start relating to it to this degree, then it becomes your task to start to get into that vehicle. I can remember so well that when T and I were first working with our students, when we had taken them out of the world and separate in isolation, and we were getting down to the nitty-gritty, nitty gritty, the information kept coming through our heads, and we would say to them, get in your vehicle. Nora, get in your vehicle. Alex, get in your vehicle. Because any time we would hear something that we knew was not an example of the knowledge of the kingdom of heaven, then they were not in their vehicle. Someone else was speaking. So our hope and our prayer for your sake is that you will start getting into that vehicle. You will start warding off all the bombardment that you will begin to hear that say, boy, is this guy crazy. Is this a cult if I ever heard one? Yes, it is. It's a cult. I mean, it's the cult of cults. It's the cult of truth. And we know what the world would like to do with it. We know that nothing can happen to us I have nothing to fear if I am a child of my Heavenly Father, nor do you. But are you going to be satisfied with just being a child of your Heavenly Father? Or are you going to take advantage of an opportunity to overcome the world with the help that he has sent you so that you can enter his kingdom, not need to return? The only reason that he gave us instruction to give you these sessions and these classrooms was to offer you a second resurrection, a chance to come in, finish your task, and enter his kingdom. And I see that we're down to five seconds. We'll see you in our next session.